workshop, we will start with showing how applications adapt to the changing world. Then we will discuss about what is reinforcement learning and what are contextual benefits. After that, we will introduce Personalizer, which is an award-winning AI service. And we will do a very exciting demo of the new feature which recently released called Apprentice Mode. And last but not least, we will dive deeper into the theory behind uh, contextual bandits and its real world usage. So nowadays, if you look at the AI services, a lot of them will fall under the category of basing on perception, like uh, text, image, speech, to do predictions. And as we are expanding on to decisions, then a lot of that is related to what uh, actions should the application take, what are the right choices, and when to make that choices. If we're looking at the traditional AI architecture, uh, a lot of them goes back to perception and prediction. And as we are expanding to decision making, then we need to transition and bring on this notion of reasoning and planning. So between the, use, uh, the friendly user interface and the enterprise system, in the middle layer of business logic, that's where we bring in the AI learning engine, which have all the machine learning elements. Today, we are going to focus on reinforcement learning, where you have uh, agents and, uh, which operates in the environment, includes all the user and data, and you will have a notion of world the agent will try different actions on the world and observe the reward and learn from the outcomes. Reinforced learn, reinforcement learning is a type of AI, uh, it's, a, it's a type of AI uh, looping, uh, going through this loop and trying to find the right decisions. A very good uh, example of reinforcement learning is doing the news recommendation where uh, with the rapidly changing world, how to recommend the content to, uh, to align with users' interest is a very big challenge. So next, I'm going to show a demo of a, uh, of a sport news website. In this demo, our goal is to increase the user engagement by prioritizing different contents for the news headline. And in this demo, the way to measure the engagement is by when using uh, when the user click on the article, how far down the user scroll on the article. And we have three potential articles to recommend. They are all related to women tennis tournaments. And one is for Wimbledon, one is for Madrid, and the other is for Australian Open. And the features we have in this example contains referrals, which means uh, where the user is coming from, whether it's social media, uh, from email, or from web search, and what is the ongoing tournaments, and what type of devices users are using, whether they're using mobile, uh, desktop, or tablets. And both on, uh, based on these features, the agent will show a personalized article. And if user feels interested and click on that, as they scroll down, we can see the engagement reward is accumulating. And after a certain period of time, the web application will send the reward to the agent. And the agent will learn from this uh, interaction between the user and the app. If we're looking at this simulated learning graph, we can see the x-axis is the total number of home page visits. And the y, uh, this includes all different user. And for the y-axis, that's the uh, user engagements. This green line shows uh, if we randomly showing articles to user, the, uh, the engagement reward will be always around 0 0.3 because we have only three articles in the pool. And the green line shows uh, using the RL model, which starts from 0 0.2, but after around like 400 events, it can reach to 0 0.8, which is a significantly uplift comparing with our baseline model. Uh, so next, I'm going to hand over to Rajan 
uh, he will dive into what is reinforcement learning and what are contextual bandit problems. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, cool. All right, let me share my screen. Okay, hopefully this works. Uh, share. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, cool. All right, so uh, my name is Rajan Chari. I'm an engineer working for Microsoft Research. Uh, I work on reinforcement learning with the same lab that uh, Chung works for. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, Chung was talking about an application that has to adapt to a changing world. Uh, so I'm going to expand on that a little bit. I'm gonna talk about how you would build this kind of an application. What are some of the uh, underlying tools and technologies you can use to, to make this happen. Uh, I'll be talking about reinforcement learning. I'll be talking about a tool that we use a lot where a lot of the, the logic, the algorithms for reinforcement learning are implemented. It's called um, Wow Waupel Wabbit uh, or VW for short. It's an open source project uh, and there's a lot of contr contributors to it. It's a uh, something that's used in research pretty extensively uh, and added to quite often. Uh, it is a low level tool and has a lot of options. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you uh, today through like a progression of commands uh, that'll help you see how the, the solution is construct constructed. But VW is probably the hard way to do reinforcement learning because there is a lot, I mean, uh, somewhat of a learning curve and some reading you'd have to do to get started. Uh, so right after my presentation, Justin's gonna show you a much easier way to do everything that I talked about. So uh, if you aren't, uh, if you're worried about it, uh, please don't worry, you'll see Justin's presentation. It's a very simple API. Uh, we've wrapped the whole thing up in, in, an, in a service. Okay, so then uh, let me get started. Uh, before I get into reinforcement learning, let me kind of position reinforcement learning with respect to all the other machine learning tools that you probably already know about. So you probably already know about uh, supervised learning. What is supervised learning? Supervised learning is where you have uh, images, one example is uh, you may have images of cats and then you have the labels associated with those images. So all your examples are labeled with the, the right name. So there's image of cat, label of a cat, image of a dog, label of a dog. Uh, you have a number of these things, a lot of data. Then you choose some supervised learning algorithm like a deep neural net or um, maybe support vector machines or boosted trees or something that uh, you enjoy using. And then you pass all this data through your supervised learning algorithm. Uh, and so what you have at the end of it is, um, is a model that you maybe would store to disk. Uh, then you would ship this model as part of your application. Uh, and now your application, when it gets an image uh, and it needs to show a label or somehow react to that image, it will then classify that image using the supervised learning model that's part of the application. Okay, so this is how you would use supervised learning today. Uh, and then uh, you would, uh, when you get new, more data, you train again and so on. So this is supervised learning. So the question is, can you use supervised learning to do the kind of things that Chang was talking about? Uh, maybe, maybe, let's, uh, let's take a look. Okay, so uh, the first question is, do you have labeled data? So when a user comes to your website, you have to show them a news article. What's the, what's the data, what's the label? Do you have an answer to this question? And the answer is no, not, not right 
uh, I mean, not uh, immediately. What you could do is you could hire an editor. You could, um, can you guys hear me okay? Because I, I don't know if uh, this is coming through. Yeah, you sound good. Okay, cool. So, uh, all right, so you don't have labeled data. So what you could do is you could hire an editor who would say, okay, these are the type of users we see. When you see this type of user, show them this type of article. Is that the right answer? Maybe, it depends on the editor. Uh, maybe the editor is biased in some way uh, and chooses to match users against stories that are not appropriate. So maybe there is no right answer. So that's uh, another problem. So you have two issues so far. The third one is that um, when you get somebody to label all these news stories uh, and match it up against users, uh, it could be that the world has already changed and there are new news stories. So for example, maybe you uh, started labeling during uh, the beginning of the year when there was Australian Open and then now it's French Open and they're all new stories. So the recommendations that you learned from before no longer work. So you have a situation where you've spent a lot of energy training a supervised learning model, but it doesn't work anymore. So, so what, what do you do? What do you do? So what you do uh, is you take a look at reinforcement learning. What's reinforcement learning? Uh, reinforcement learning is where, um, excuse me, I'm just gonna rearrange my notes. Okay, so reinforcement learning is where, uh, it's a branch of machine learning where the problems of, uh, the, that are solved are slightly different. So what's the problem, problem that's solved? The problem that's solved is the world provides uh, you a context. Uh, and then you have to make a decision. You have to choose one action among many actions. Uh, when you make this decision of which news story to show or which action to pick, you have to balance between the knowledge you already have, exploiting that knowledge uh, about users and actions and discovering new information. You have to uh, explore the actions even though it may not be the best action because you have to learn if these actions are good. Uh, then once you provide an action, you play an action to the world, you show a news article to the user, then you get feedback. So, uh, and the feedback might be good, it might be bad, but you wanna learn from this feedback. And so once you learn from that feedback, well, how do you learn? You have the context, you have the action that was chosen, and then you, you have the reward, the feedback signal from the world. And there is a couple of little other bits you need, but then you learn from it, and then you repeat. You, uh, once again, a new user shows up, you explore, uh, or you exploit the data that you already have, you get feedback, you learn, and so on. And so now you have a system that's able to react to a world that's changing. Okay, so that's reinforcement learning in a nutshell. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the particular flavor of reinforcement learning that uh, we use uh, a lot. And uh, this is called contextual bandit. This is a set of algorithms that work well in these kind of conditions. What is contextual bandit? Contextual bandit is, is very, very, uh, like the formulation is very uh, similar to what I talked about in reinforcement learning. In a contextual bandit algorithm, you're presented, the algorithm is presented with a set of actions. Uh, it chooses one of those actions and then it gets a reward uh, and then it learns from it. So, the important thing about contextual bandit as a machine learning algorithm, as opposed to supervised learning, is that you, it only gets to know about the one choice it took and not about all the other choices. So, so that's uh, contextual bandit. I'm going to now jump into BW, the tool, to show you contextual bandits in action. All right, so let me... Uh, Go here. Are you still able to see my screen? Do you see a, a screen with a, a code editor on it? You see VS Code. 
Yep, cool, thank you. All right, so I'm going to first start with the data that you need to learn from. So I'm gonna start with data. The data looks a little bit like this. Um, okay, so on the, there's two parts to the, uh, to the data. Each line is an example of an interaction. Uh, on the on the right side is uh, are the features. This is information about the context, the world, the user that came in, uh, the action that was chosen, some of the features about that action, etc. On the left side is the uh, thing that's uh, similar to the label in supervised learning. In this case, it's the ID of the action that was chosen, some cost. Uh, well. I mentioned reward before, but uh, in machine learning research, really people work with cost. So it's sort of the opposite of a reward. So in this case, it's negative one, uh, which, is, uh, which is good. So if this was a bad uh, interaction, then you would actually see a positive one here because that would mean a positive cost. And then there's this last bit of data. So, so I have the action ID, which is one, the cost, for that action, for taking that action, which is negative one. And then I have uh, this last bit of data, which is the probability with which I chose that action. So I'm gonna go into this, uh, the probability bit a little bit later, uh, when I talk a little bit more about exploring and exploitation, et cetera. So, but for now, uh, let's just say that these are the three pieces of data I need as a label to be able to run the contextual bandit algorithm that we have. So this is the data we're going to learn from. This is the data that would uh, come from the website. Uh, and then I'm going to show you what the prediction file looks like. This is when a user comes to the website and you ask the algorithm to predict uh, which action to choose. So uh, it's very similar to the data for uh, uh, learning. And uh, the only thing that's missing is really the label. So it's supposed to, it's going to predict uh, which action to take. Uh, and then I have, uh, yeah, so that's, that's it. So let's, let's uh, go through the script and see what we're going to do here. I'm going to actually run the script first, and then um, we'll talk through what is happening in the script. Okay, so um, let me close this window. Okay, so what I did first is uh, Using no nothing that I've learned so far, I'm trying to predict what actions the algorithm is going to choose. Since it, since it has no information, it's it's uh, picking really the first action. It says always choose the first action. Why not? I guess it you know it doesn't know anything better, so it just says no matter what the context is, always pick one. That's what this is. Uh, this the part that precedes it. This part is really uh, the, uh, the VW executable displaying a number of uh, uh, data points to show me how it's doing the prediction. So you can ignore that for now. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is we're gonna take the data file that I showed you, the training data, and we're gonna pass it through VW. And uh, after, I do that, it's going, to, it's, uh, it's going to learn something. So the thing I want to highlight here is that uh, this is the output of VW, and you can see that there's something called the average loss. Okay, so uh, the lower the loss, the better the learning. Uh, what this is telling me is that initially it didn't predict very well, and then hopefully it got better. So it's learned something. So ne the next thing I'm going to do is uh, uh, run the prediction file again, and now it's it's showing me uh, the three con the three actions it's chosen. I, I've I purposely set it up so that the first action should really say one, and the second one should say two, and the third one 
should say three. So it is predicting correctly now that if the first user showed up, it would show them the, the first action. Right. So, uh, but we're not done yet. And um, what we're gonna do is, is uh, continue to learn more. So I'm gonna run it again through the training data. And now you see that the average loss uh, is in fact much, much lower. So what this is telling me is that its predictions are getting much better. Uh, I'm going to run it again through the, the test file and it's gonna give me the same actions. The actions haven't changed, but internally it really did learn more. And we can tell that by looking at the average loss during training. So that's the first demo. Uh, where I've introduced contextual bandits and VW. The second demo, we're going to add a little bit to this. This is vanilla contextual bandit. We're going to add on top of this some exploration. Okay, so now we have to talk a little bit more about uh, what that third number was. So, a question to ask is if you already know a little bit about the world, uh, sh how much should you exploit that information and how much should you explore some of your other choices uh, so that you can learn more about the world? So a very simple exploration strategy, by the way, the exploration strategies and reinforcement learning are an area of active research. So uh, we continue to make progress here I'm gonna talk about the simplest one, Epsilon Greedy, but there are several others that are already implemented in VW that you can play with. Uh, you can go to the VW open source website and take a look at uh, the, the documentation for these algorithms and uh, how to create data for them, et cetera. Okay, so let's go back to Epsilon Greedy. How does Epsilon Greedy work? It's, it's the, it's, you know, you probably guess how it works. Uh, you give it some value for Epsilon, let's say 20%. Uh, and then what the algorithm does is it exploits the best action based on its uh, currently learned predictions uh, with an 80% probability. And then it chooses the other actions, like uh, among all the other actions, with a 20% probability. So that's what Epsilon Greedy is. Uh, it, uh, ex you know, you can, you can tune it, you can, change the epsilon parameter to, from 20% to 30% or, uh, or whatever you want. If you want to be a little bit more bold, you could go with a higher number. But uh, the thing to remember is if you have a high exploration budget, that means that you're making choices that you know are suboptimal. Uh, but the trade-off is that you're, you are learning about all those other actions. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a demo here. All right, let's go one level up. Okay. Uh, actually, before I do this demo, uh, I want to walk you through the shell script just a little bit. So I'm gonna walk you through the first one just to give you a little bit more information than I did in the past. I forgot to go through it in the last slide. Okay, so uh, this is the shell script I ran before. Uh, all I'm doing here is clearing my local disk, uh, removing all the predictions and models, etc. Then the first time uh, I run this command, it's basically predicting with no information. This is where we saw that it predicted one each time. Uh, to dig a little bit more into the command line, here we're saying, okay, run the CB algorithm with three actions. Uh, and then here's the data file. And then write your predictions to a prediction file. That's what this first line does. The minus minus CB3 says use the CB algorithm with three actions. So the next line here that's interesting is uh, where we do the learning. Here we're passing in this, the learn, the training data file. We're again specifying 
there are three actions for contextual bandit. Oh, and by the way, when you're done, please write the model to some disks, to a file. Uh, let's call it a CV model. That's the name of the file it's gonna write it into. Uh, you can ignore the, this is just to print the output for each line. So, so this step here is learning. Uh, and then we're going to use the learned model to do prediction. This is what the last example uh, showed you. So I'm going to show you what's in the, in the second example. It looks very similar. We're removing all the predictions and the models and the caches, et cetera. We're going to say, ask it to predict once again. Uh, but this time, instead of saying the algorithm, instead of providing CB as the algorithm, we're going to say CB explore is the algorithm. And here, once again, we're going to say uh, choose uh, among three actions. So we have to specify how many actions there are. So we're going to say choose between three actions. Uh, here's the epsilon parameter I talked about. This is the exploration budget. So this is when you don't uh, when you don't want to use the best prediction, what is the probability of picking one of the other actions? So that's what that does. And uh, let's take a look at the output. Okay, so the output is a little different. Uh, it isn't one, one, one this time. Instead, it's these three lines and each line has three numbers in it. Well, that's odd. Okay, so let's take a look. So what it's showing you here is instead of saying, this is the action you should choose, it's saying, okay, with 86% probability, you should pick the first action. And with 6.6% uh, probability, pick the second, and 6.6% .6 probability, pick the third. So it's taking the 80% and assigning it to the best possible action that it knows about. And then it's distributing the 20% among all the actions, which is why it's a little bit more than 80%. Um, but in this case, it's saying, you know, it's showing you the same distribution for all three actions, which, which tells you that it hasn't learned anything yet. It can't make a decision, given the three contexts, what to choose. By the way, the data file is still the same. It's still using the same uh, training data and the same prediction data. It's just now uh, the output is a uh, probability distribution. Okay, so then uh, we're going to now have played some actions and now we have training data and now we're going to learn. Okay, so this tells you the output of learning and here you can see that there's a there's a loss. Uh, it's not, too, it's not uh, as big as it was the last time. Uh, so it's learned something now we're going to apply this learning against uh, the uh, test file to see what happens. Okay, so now you can see that it's giving you new, new answers to the same old questions. What it's telling you is for the first context, pick the first action with a very high probability. But for the second context, pick the second action with a very high probability and uh, the same for the third one. So it's actually giving you three different answers based on three different contexts. Uh, so what this is telling you is that CB Explore is learning through exploration and it's telling you how to do further exploration so it can gain more data. I'm just gonna go through the, the learn step one more time and uh, you should see that the loss has decreased even further so we know that uh, the learning does continue, uh, but the answer isn't going to be any different because that's the way epsilon greedy is. If you had used one of the other exploration distributions, uh, you would see that the distribution would change at this point. Okay, so this is contextual bandits with exploration. I don't know how I'm doing on time here. So, but I'll keep going. Someone interrupt me if I'm running over. Uh, now we're going to take a look at our slide. So we've covered exploration. Let's now take a look at the next thing we have to do. Okay, so this is 
the fact that we have to choose the number of actions ahead of time, uh, maybe some of you already wondered like this, how useful is this? Uh, so uh, there is an uh, improvement that we can make to this algorithm. Uh, it's called action dependent features. And when you use this improvement, you no longer have to specify the number of actions. So um, I'm going to show you the way this works. Okay, so this is number three. Uh, oh, and by the way, this is the final form of the contextual bandit that you want to use in your own application. So I'm going to go to number three. Let's take a look. Okay, so the first thing here I want to say before I show you the data, I mean, show you the, the script, is that the data is different. So uh, now the things that we're going to learn from is, is slightly different the way it's presented. In this case, uh, we actually have some, some way of saying, okay, there's a state uh, of the world that is true no matter what action you take. For example, you're going to pick something for a given user. So in that case, uh, this goes in this kind of features, they go into this shared feature set. So that's what the first line is telling us is that there is some kind of context information about the world. That's true. Uh, the next three lines are sort of the correspond to the three actions. Uh, and in this case, it's only the first action that was chosen and we recorded the training data here. So the first action was chosen. The uh, reward for it was uh, negative one, which is good. I'm sorry, the cost is negative one, so the reward is positive. And the probability with which this action was chosen was 5%. So uh, it wasn't one of the actions that you would have predicted as the best action. In this case, it turns out to be the right choice because there was a, the, the cost was low or the reward was high. So this is what the first example is telling us, first interaction. Uh, similarly, there's a second interaction where the best action is the second action because the user is different. Uh, and then the, finally, the third one, again, is the same kind of thing. We have a third user who is uh, who has uh, who follows another player? So, for her, uh, the reward is high for the third action. So that's what the data is telling us. This is a little bit of a toy example. In real life, you're going to have thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, or even millions of interactions, and and the data, you know, uh, would be more complicated than this. Okay, so that's the data we're going to learn from. Uh, what about prediction? The prediction file looks exactly like the, the learn file, I mean the training file, except that it's missing the labels. It's missing what the, um, the one prediction, that was, the one action that was taken. Uh, the first three examples are exactly like the learning, the, the training examples. The last two are interesting. They're a little different. Here, we're going to introduce new new news stories that this algorithm has never seen before. Uh, and, and let's see what happens when we run both the predictions and the training. Okay, so let's go here. Okay, so I did the same thing this time. Uh, I tried to predict with no information. And um, the reason I know that this is working is because it's choosing every action with the same probability. So all three actions have the same probability uh, for the first example, and same for the second one, same for the third one. The last one has one more action. So in this case, uh, we're incorporating that into the answer. And so the probability is, uh, instead of being one third, is, uh, is a one fourth for each action. So this is before any learning happens. Next, we're going to learn something. And so this is us learning. Uh, you 
you by now you know the thing you want to look for is this average loss number to see uh, you know what that looks like and then when you run it again does it go down that's the question you want to ask yourself okay so in this case we learned something let's see how how well we learned all right so now we're predicting okay so now things look different uh, okay so now we have a probability distribution that's uh, not uniform. And here the first line is telling us that action zero should be taken with 86% uh, probability and the others with uh, the 6% probability. The second line is telling us action one should get the 86%. Uh, the third line is telling us action two should get the 86%. Now, here are the two other interesting examples, the one where we introduce new actions. Here, it still gives a pretty high uh, exploit probability to the, the best action, uh, but then it says, okay, for the third action that you added, explore that with a 5% probability. So this is us introducing new actions into the mix that the algorithm's never seen before. And so what that'll do is eventually we'll collect enough data to learn about those other actions. And so when we move from uh, Australian Open to French Open, these new stories will start to get, see some action and eventually we'll learn that the new stories are more interesting to users than the old stories. Uh, this is once again us learning a, a bit more, even though the probability distribution isn't gonna change, uh, but our average loss has decreased once again. And the probability continues to be the same, but that's okay. So that's my third demonstration of contextual bandits with exploration and action dependent features. This is the form of contextual bandits you wanna use in your application. Okay, so we talked about contextual bandits. We talked about reinforcement learning. Uh, I also want to kind of uh, end with this last thought, which is that in supervised learning, when you change a hyperparameter, for example, you add a new layer to your neural net, you can compare those two uh, ways of learning by checking the accuracy, the uh, precision uh, and the recall, et cetera. Uh, and so that's how you compare two different versions of models in supervised learning. But in reinforcement learning, things are not that easy because uh, if you choose a different learning mechanism, it is gonna choose a different action. And so therefore the uh, the actions that you recorded earlier that you learned from are no longer valid because the new algorithm isn't gonna choose those actions. So how do we deal with this problem? How do we compare two algorithms and still continue to learn from the data we recorded before? Uh, for this, we have a tool called uh, counterfactual evaluation. Uh, and again, this is uh, not something I can get into in detail because of time, but uh, others will touch upon it. And it is available in an easy to use uh, fashion in the in the service that Justin will cover. Are there any questions I can uh, answer? Uh, I see in the Q and A we have a few questions. I'm not sure if you already go over yet. Uh, how do I get there? So, so there's I a few questions. Sharing? What's that? Uh, there's a few yeah. questions. I don't know. Okay. Um, Paul's been answering some of them by text. Paul, maybe, uh, maybe we could ask Raj on one, or you could you could speak for a bit if you'd like for some of these questions. Oh well, Rajan, go ahead. Just take uh, one of the open ones. And, uh, yeah. uh, do you want to just read it to me? Uh, okay. Uh, for demo three, there are three unique visitors. How could this possibly extrapolate to new visitors? Are there features not shown? Right, okay, so that's a good question. 
Uh, first, I want to say that this is a toy example, and I try to make it as simple as possible. So yeah, the, the, so that's true. Uh, for us, a visitor is not a name, but the set of features that comprise that person. So uh, even though there are three unique visitors, in real life, there's probably uh, a number of features that make up a user. And so what we care about really are the features. We don't really care about the unique users so much. Not sure if that answers the question. So in the, in the context that I showed you where it says shared, that line, uh, we would have features that represent a person. And what we're learning is the association between those features and the actions they take. So for example, uh, this here is of course a unique user, but what you would normally have in an application is something like uh, country, uh, US or something like that. Uh, and then, um, uh, I don't know, age, uh, 20, et cetera, something like that. So that's how you uh, deal with the fact that you don't want to learn for individual users for, but for large groups of uh, users somehow. Should I try to take one, one more or are we out of time? How are we doing? Well, there's another one here that asks, um, is it possible to take diversity of recommended articles into account? Uh, and is it possible to address filter bubble with this algorithm? Do you want to take that one, Paul? Yeah, okay. Uh, so there's kind of like several answers to this question. <laughs> I'm gonna hit this answer live button. Okay, the first one is, if you are recommending several articles at the same time to be shown at the same time, we have another algorithm in the system called uh, CCB, which is designed to make uh, multiple decisions at the same time. And in that case, um, you can get sensitivity to diversity within the individual set of decisions that you are making right now. Now, there's uh, another answer to this question, which has to do with, I showed you an article some time ago, maybe an hour ago, uh, which was recommended by our system, and now you're back, okay? And how do I avoid showing you the same thing again? So uh, first of all, to be clear, contextual bandits don't do any explicit planning. The only planning they do is implicit in the reward signal that you give them. However, even though they're not planning, there's nothing from preventing you from putting information about previous decisions into the input to the current decision. So in a user profile, you can keep a digest of the, the articles that you've shown someone already. And you can either just explicitly like uh, filter them out before you ask, say, VW or Personalizer to, to do the recommendation. Or you can just kind of include them in a way that lets uh, the algorithm learn that uh, showing similar stuff to what's been shown recently might be a bad idea. By the way, it might be a good idea. So um, it can be helpful to be data-driven in this sense. All right, with respect to the filter bubble, uh, yeah, so classic recommendation systems were kind of like subject to these kinds of biases because they did not do proper counterfactual estimation. So one of the reasons for the existence of this contextual bandit platform uh, for the recommendation vertical specifically is that yes, it can address the filter bubble. By randomizing its decisions, by using both a combination of user features and action features, it can sort of escape uh, from what it has already shown a user already and uh, discover things um, new. 
All right, I don't know how we're doing on time. Maybe I think it's uh, it's getting kind of uh, tight because okay. we got an hour and three more people to go. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to stop now. Uh, so, uh, Justin, do you want to take yes, a I'm sharing my screen and can you guys see my screen and hear my uh, voice okay? I can hear you, yes, and I can see a screen, yep. Great. But uh, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, I can see it. Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin. Uh, I work at Microsoft. Um, we built a product called Personalizer. Um, at Microsoft over here. So I'm just gonna give an overview on this service. Uh, hold on one second. So um, in the previous session, Rajan um, showed the powerful tool of Mobile Babbit uh, for re reinforcement, reinforcement learning use cases. Um, here at Microsoft, um, we try to make this workflow even easier uh, by using this personalizer service. So if you recall these slides from uh, the beginning of this workshop, um, it, when you say you, you want to leverage the power of uh, machine learning or AI in general um, into your business system to serve your customer, normally if you build a model from scratch, that will take a lot of time and uh, a team of engineers, researchers. So um, this is where uh, you can start using some of the open source library like uh, the VW, um, Reinforcement Learning Library. Well, um, VW is a great tool for uh, reinforcement learning workflows, but uh, there, there, there's a lot of work you have to do if you really wanna use that in real production environment. For example, you have to worry about um, how you collect your data, how to do data storage, um, how, how you want to train your model uh, in a consistent way. And also um, you need to figure out a way to do hyperparameter tuning and also um, some other uh, infrastructure issue you have to worry about like scalability and also some performance metrics you may want to look um, to see how the system perform over time. Um, in order to make this um, entire production workflow more um, uh, integrated and seamless, we created this uh, product called Personalizer. It runs on uh, Microsoft Azure Cloud. So this is the official side of Personalizer. We designed this um, service um, in order to make this um, onboarding to production um, much easier and uh, really quick. So you can basically go into Azure portal and create a resource and start using it in a few minutes. And you don't even have to have any data in place uh, to start using it. When the production traffic flows in, the service will just start learning in real time and you can see how it learns, how it tries to improve over time. So uh, what can Personalizer really do? Uh, basically, when we, provide, when we provide a list of actions, Personalizer is trying to choose the best option from the list with given context information. So some of the example uh, here at Microsoft, we use Personalizer is, um, one example is if you are familiar with Windows 10 um, uh, operating system, uh, the picture you see on the lock screen when, that was called uh, Windows Spotlight that was powered by Personalizer service to show a, a yearly a landscape picture and it will ask you if you like it or not. Um, so this is powered by um, a personalizer service and also collect the uh, feedback from the user by the button. If you like it, that would be a positive reward. Uh, if you don't like it, that would be negative reward, uh, something like that. And also um, the personalizer service can uh, adapt to the latest trend. So for example, you have, uh, um, so in, in traditional machine learning, you have to define a fixed uh, feature space uh, or um, action space. Uh, in Personalizer, uh, we support new context feature and new actions to be added on the fly. So it's easier to uh, add new relevant features to improve performance or discover new trends. 
And like I said, um, this uh, service is powered by Reinforcement Learning Library, Mobile Rabbit, um, the tool uh, Rajan just introduced. So I just want to go over a simple example here and to uh, explain how the personalizer service really works here. So uh, for example, I'm building a simple news app to serve my customer and I'm, I'm using personalizer service in Azure. And the personalizer service uses two simple web APIs um, for interactions. The first one is called rank and the second one is called reward. So let's say my app is used, used by this particular user and when the user sign in, I probably will have some context information about this user or say the device the user is using um, for making this request. And also maybe I have the location of this user, uh, the time of the day, the weather, um, those all can be context information here. And also what I need is a list of actions. Uh, for example, in this case, I have three news articles and uh, I wanna pick one of them to display to my user and hopefully the user will like it. So with these two pieces of information, I send the request to the rank API and ask the personalizer um, which one should I choose to display to the user. And on the back end, um, this personalizer API, uh, rank API will try to um, yeah, leverage the VW reinforcement learning model to do the inferencing. And then we have an answer returned. So let's try the second one as, as suggested by the personalizer service. And, and the user will see the second news article and the user may like it or not. So depending on the um, feedback, we send the reward score back to the reward API. So if the user like it, we probably wanna send a positive reward like one. If the user basically just ignore it or even dislike it, we probably wanna do something like a, a zero, uh, which means a uh, negative reward. Um, and then we call the reward API here and the reward API will correlate this event with the previous rank event. Um, so this information uh, is all we need to train the RL model and try to improve. So hopefully it will do, um, it will do better next time. So um, that's the simple use case. Um, I just wanna show, uh, this is the creation page. You can just go to Azure portal and search personalizer um, on the search bar and then you will show up a, uh, a creation page and all the, all the information you need is just a unique name and you need the subscription and pick your location. And then uh, that's, that's the simple uh, page you have to go over to deploy. So uh, for example, I just want to quickly show how this works. Create a resource, um, personalizer, create, just do a unique name. Usually we call a personalizer instance a loop. So we just call it test demo loop over here and pick a uh, subscription list. I'll pick what as you as to. And resource group is an Azure term to um, refer to a collection of resources for easier management. So I just click create over here. The deployment will start. It will take a few minutes. So I will switch to a resource that I just created this morning, um, right before this session. Um, so once the resource is created, we just go to the resources link. So we provided a quick start guide uh, here. It has the step-by-step -step guide, uh, guide on how you wanna uh, use this service. It also contains the link to the document, some code samples over here. But the only two pieces of information uh, you need to start using this is um, located over here in the key and endpoint section. Um, so this is the endpoint for your particular uh, loop. So name.cognitiveservice.azure.com. You need this one and you also need API keys or any of the API keys over here. Um, this is for authentication purpose. So to be able to use this one, I can show a quick 
demo over here. Uh, so I used the demo I just created. It. This is the same uh, same name uh, the endpoint that I just, just copied. So I, I already set the re, uh, resource key, which is the API key I, ju I just showed, but uh, I removed the value just for a security purpose. Um, okay, let's go back to the slides. Yes. Yes, that's the that's the place where you find the endpoint and keys. So um, before I run the actual demo, I, I just want to have a brief introduction or more with more detail on the two APIs here. So the first one is the rank API. You want to send your request to. So it's a post API, and the information you need is the endpoint that you can find from the Azure portal. Um, so Azure uh, the end uh, endpoint. Uh, is all you need to send a rank request. And because this is a post API, you need a request body um, to, be able to, to be able to use this uh, API. Uh, the two pieces of information over here will be in JSON format. So you need the context features. Um, so here I have two features, time of the day and the weather. Um, it can be any value over here. And you need to provide a list of actions that you wanna pick from. So here I only list two actions. It, it can be multiple actions. I just want to save some, base, some space over here. And once you send the rank request, you will receive a response like this, also in JSON format. And it has a ranking of all the actions you send over. Um, that's the uh, prediction uh, or recommendation that the personalizer made based on your context features you send over here. And it has a reward action ID. This is the, the suggested action that you wanna display to your user and to try to collect feedback on this. And also the event ID, you notice over here, this is the, a, a GUID, um, just to, um, you will need this GUID to be able to send a reward, a, a reward call. Uh, just like uh, you can see over here, the reward API consists of an endpoint and also the event ID you retrieved from the rank uh, request, uh, rank response. And the, the request body is very simple. You just need to send the uh, reward value over here. But the reward value, you, you need to determine what the value will be. Um, usually you need to map this to your business logic and the recommend um, range of reward value is uh, between zero and one. Okay. Uh, Okay, so uh, I, I'm gonna do a demo on a, a simple coffee recommendation um, app that I wanna build. So I just wanna uh, briefly introduce the background of this. Um, so, uh, let's see. Yep, so the, I have three context features over here, the customer name, the time of the day, and type of weather. So in the demo, I will pick random value um, for each of the three features, just to mimic a you know random user making the call at a random time of the day at under random weather, uh, just so that the personalizer can learn from different information, try to um, make recommendation um, differently. Okay, so we'll switch back to the demo page. Okay, so this is the this is the thing we just look at. Also, we have something um, created over here, based, uh, which is the ground truth. So we want to have a uh, user preference table here for lookup. So if the personalizer make a prediction, and we want to know whether this prediction is good or not, so we need to compare the prediction with the ground truth uh, here to determine whether we provide a positive reward or a negative reward. So a little helper method over here, just to do the uh, check. I loaded 10,000 random samples. Uh, so I just wanna show over here, we can do a uh, random, randomly pick a sample over here and cons uh, construct the request body. The context feature here for Bob's on a sunny morning and 
if I run that again, there will be a different value over here. But the list of coffee, we have four, uh, four types of coffees to uh, choose from. The list of coffee won't change because that's the uh, four action list that we have. And we just make the API run calls. This is the rank API I just showed in the slides. This one is for this particular loop. And I send, a, I use the post request, send the post request. I got a 201, uh, which is successful. And I got the response from the service. Um, we have the latte as recommended by the personalized service. We also have the event ID that we'll be using later. And then we want to compare the prediction value latte with the ground truth that, that we just seen um, previously. So if we do comparison, uh, it doesn't match. So we got a zero reward. And we right now we want to send the reward back to the API. The reward URL look like this. It has the event ID within the URL. And we can just send the reward back to the API. And we got 204, uh, which is successful, but we don't expect any response. Uh, we just need a status. So this is just one loop of a rank and reward. And to, so the personalizer service, in order to learn, it has to see a lot of real-time data. So here we run a simulation on 10,000 uh, samples. So this will take some time. Uh, so I run it uh, beforehand. I just want to show the results over here. So um, see, we have um, each we have 100 batches over here. Each batch consists of 100 events. So I calculate uh, the percentage of correct prediction from the personalizer while when I compare with the ground truth. So you can see that we started from uh, we started from the 25 percent around 25 percent. Uh, because we have four actions um, at the very beginning you will basically just do a random guess so that's 25 and you go up um, somewhere 60 percent and then stabilized around 50 55 percent so you can see it definitely is learning um, so it's performing better than the random um, baseline but you you may ask um, is this the best we can do here um, is there a way to improve the performance? So um, we provided a, um, a tool called offline evaluation, which is um, corresponding to the uh, counterfactual evaluation that Roger introduced. So you can do the offline evaluation to do some hyperparameter tuning, uh, which is uh, very easy, can be done via the uh, Azure portal. So I already run this on a pre, uh, on a is existing loop which has uh, some historical data. So you need some historical data like ten thousand. Um, depending on your scenario, you, you need some data to be able to run the uh, evaluation job over here. So it provides a comparison between your current online hyperparameters with some others like the random, which is the baseline random guess. Um, the accuracy is around uh, 25, 20, 30% over here. And it also has optimized uh, hyperparameter here, which has the highest performance. And so usually for simplest use case, you just, um, you just wanna leverage this one and you can just click apply here and the hyperparameter will, will be automatically applied to your model and your model will be retrained using this set of hyperparameters on the historical data. So you can expect your model perform on a similar level as this line. So, so then we load another 10,000 samples over here. Um, because we already run the evaluation, so we try um, another 10,000 events, and this is the result. So, uh, the, so the first half is the result from um, the previous run before the evaluation, around 50%, and then after the evaluation, the performance goes to 85%, 90%. So you can see a, a large jump in the performance. 
Okay, so we'll go back to the slides. Yeah, so this is the page. Um, you can also uh, go to download a, a detailed hyperparameter in the file to look at the details if you are familiar with how VW uh, parameters work. And also, uh, another tool that we provided uh, as part of the offline evaluation is called feature importance. So when you run a evaluation, we'll provide a list of feature importance or feature effectiveness um, to show here. So um, the reason we provide this is that it can help you to learn what, what are the features you actually send over to us. Um, so for example, you may see some features that are very important on the top, and you can also see some features um, on the bottom, which means um, it is not very effective. So you may, you may wanna consider removing those features um, from your request. Um, so to reduce the payload, something like that. Also another, another thing you may consider is that uh, you, you wanna take a look at the list of features, trying to see if there's anything you don't wanna actually send. For example, some privacy information or um, something that may cause compliance issue. You may wanna remove those from your future request. Um, also, so the next one, I wanna um, introduce some um, configurations you can do on personalizer loop. Um, just a few important stuff here. So the reward wait time you can configure, uh, which means the, um, the time on the rank event will be waiting for the corresponding reward event. So that really, the setting should be dependent on your, your use case here and depending on how long your customer need to uh, give feedback. If you set this too short, like a few seconds, um, you know, the user may not have enough time to, to uh, really provide the feedback. So you, you just lock, lost the signal. And the exploration um, number here, um, the Rajan introduced the exploration and exploitation trade-off so you should be familiar with this number already. The 20% is the default value that we provided. Uh, so last, I wanna provide some um, links to the official documents and code samples for personalizer. You can just go to this link, aka.ms slash personalizer docs or personalizer samples to take a look and start exploring. And you may want to start from this concept, sec uh, concept section to learn mm, some use cases. What you know, um, you know what, what's the business scenario use case that you can use personalizer to improve the performance uh, or experience. And also, we provided some uh, code samples, uh, also the uh, API documents, uh, some tutorials for web app chatbot um, with all this use case you can leverage personalizer and uh, last i want to uh, mention is that we have a, a reinforcement learning and decision ai community uh, group there's an open group so you're welcome to join uh, we have the product team including pms engineers and uh, researchers uh, in the group so you can ask questions and connect with the wider community over there um, so with all this personalized has to offer, uh, you may be asking that um, if you already have a policy or a strategy to do personalization uh, or recommendation in your production environment, how, how do I know if personalizer will do even better than my current policy? Then, um, so this question can be answered by a new feature that we just released uh, that's called apprentice mode and my teammate Dwight um, will give a talk on that topic. Thank you. Dwight? Yeah, thanks Justin. Hi, I am Doipan from the Personalizer team at Microsoft and I'm going to talk about the new apprentice mode for Personalizer. As Justin mentioned before, Personalizer uses reinforcement learning in an interactive setting. 
This is a fancy way of saying that the model continuously learns from interacting with the environment. Now you might be asking how long does the model take to learn? Paul will get into that in more detail, but I want to show you a new feature we introduced that completely obviates the need to even ask this question. This feature is called Apprentice Mode and its purpose is to allow Personizer to learn from your application's existing logic and behavior before you decide to allow it to make any business decision for you. One of the facets of real-world reinforcement learning is that you don't train it using sample data like regular machine learning models. You deploy it in production and that's where it starts learning. So any new model you deploy takes time to learn before it can start performing at some reasonable baseline level. This is absolutely okay for many of our customers, but then equally there's a few for which that unknown from when a model is deployed to the time it gets trained up to some baseline may not be acceptable because there's a lot of real time decisions being made and that will affect the outcomes what they're after. In order to address this gap, we have introduced this new feature called Apprentice Mode Learning Behavior. And just like how an apprentice learns from the master, your personalizer model is going to learn from your application's existing logic and behavior before you decide to deploy it in your production environment. Personalizer trains by mimicking the same output as the application. As more events flow in, Personalizer can catch up to the existing application logic without impacting the real world business decisions. Once Personalizer has learned and attained a certain level of understanding, the developer can change the behavior from apprentice mode to current or online mode. And at that time, Personalizer starts influencing the actions in the rank API and actually starts making the business decisions for you. Using apprentice mode met is very easy. Apprentice mode metrics are available from the Azure portal and the API and these can help you understand the performance as the model learns over time. You can compare the average reward that Personalizer is getting with the average baseline reward and how close Personalizer is in achieving the same business performance as the baseline logic. Once you're satisfied with the performance of Personalizer, you can switch from apprentice mode to online mode from the Azure portal and this does not require you to make any code change. So let's go over the uh, apprentice mode learning logic. As you have seen, a personalizer uses explore and exploit to recommend an action and then uses the reward it gets from the user to train the model. So what happens in apprentice mode? Say for example, the use case is to recommend a fruit with uh, the three different meals in a day and say for simplicity the baseline logic is such that it recommends an apple for all the three events. So as you can see in row one the baseline recommended action A0 is apple for breakfast, lunch and dinner. When you are in apprentice mode the user will always be shown the baseline action and the user reward is recorded. So row two, R0 for action A0 is one for breakfast, 0.5 for lunch, and zero for dinner. Internally, Personalizer will be using its train model to make a recommendation. So look at row three. Personalizer is recommending banana for breakfast and apple for lunch and dinner. And the most interesting part now is the fourth row where the reward logic is tweaked or changed in apprentice mode where we feed it a positive reward only when its recommended action matches the baseline action. Otherwise, it gets a zero reward. So when in for breakfast, when personalizer recommends banana, which is different than the baseline, it gets a reward of zero because it can't match baseline action. For lunch, it matches the baseline action and therefore it gets a reward of 0.5, which the user gave for, for um, Apple. And then uh, if you look at the third event, even though it's able to match the baseline action, since the user reward was zero <coughs> for Apple, it also gets a reward of zero. 
So this makes personalizer model to converge with the baseline logic. We also track two different metrics, which is the imitation rate ratio. This is the ratio of the count of events when personalizer uh, recommended action is the same as baseline action over the total number of events. And then we have the reward attainment ratio, which is the sum of rewards when a personalizer recommended action is the same as baseline over the total number of rewards received by the application over, the, over all the events. And a user should target around 60 to 80 percent over these two ratios to make the switch from apprentice mode to online mode. A value of around 80 percent is a really good target where you can have a high confidence that um, personalizer is able to uh, act as the same efficiency as the baseline logic. So I'm going to go uh, and show you an active uh, personalizer account, which is in apprentice mode uh, in the Azure portal. And uh, you can see that when you go to the configuration settings uh, for your personalizer account, you can you will see this learning behavior tab. And this has two options, online and apprentice. And since this one is in apprentice mode, the second one is selected. <clears throat> and uh, now moving over to the evaluations uh, settings for this account, you will see the different metrics that we show for apprentice mode. So uh, it shows that this account was uh, uh, switched to apprentice mode on 21st of July around 4 p.m. Uh, it's been running in apprentice mode for two days and it has received around 23,000 events. Uh, then we show you the three metrics. The first one is the baseline average reward. This is the average reward that uh, the baseline logic is getting from the user, which is around 0.66. Personalizer average reward is the reward that the application is getting when personalizer's recommendation is matching that of baseline and this is currently at like 0.42 and the ratio of the above two is is the reward attainment ratio which sits at around 72 percent and this is only for 23,000 events uh, so our recommendation is to send at least 50,000 events uh, before you 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 know try thinking about making the switch but a target of around 500,000 events is a very ideal one so that you can have a high level of confidence that personalizer will be um, at the same efficiency as the baseline logic so why or when should we use apprentice mode so developers can use apprentice mode to make sure the rank and reward APIs are being used correctly in the application and that features being sent to personalizer from the application contains no bugs or non-relevant features such as timestamp or user ID elements, etc. Data scientists can use apprentice mode to validate that the features being used to train personalizer models are effective and adequate. They can also optimize the number, the amount of time to wait for the user's reward to come in, which we call uh, the reward wait time. Lastly, the business decision makers can use apprentice mode to assess the potential of personalizer to improve average reward as compared to existing business logic. This allows them to make an informed decision impacting user experience where uh, real revenue and uh, user satisfaction are at stake. Apprentice mode also helps in mitigating cold start problems by, by allowing the user to skip the learning curve of personalizer and use it only when it's achieved a satisfactory level of effectiveness of around 60 to 80 percent. So apprentice mode is available in public re review right now. Uh, you can try out Apprentice Mode in the free F0 tire for lower volume traffic. 
for higher volume traffic you have to be in e0 tier yeah so i hope uh, more and more people can start on modding on to personalizer with this cool new feature and uh, please send in questions in the chat and we'll be happy to answer them and thank you and have fun using personalizer yeah so i think we are running a bit over time so i'll just ask paul to uh, talk about how to make uh, uh, contextual bandits work in uh, practice thanks Okay. All right. Uh, I'm just going to cover a few practical tips. Uh, when you're kicking the tires with this system for the first time, uh, you're very likely not to get the results that you want. And um, that's just a natural consequence of, you know, you're trying to do something ambitious for the first time. So the good news about using a mature product is that you know that the core learning algorithms are implemented with a high degree of fidelity. So now the question is, why aren't you getting the results you hoped for? Well, there's something that no one ever talks about, uh, which is how do I go about debugging a learning system? You know, like maybe if you took a traditional computer science coursework at a university, they taught you all sorts of things about how to debug traditional software, but this is some kind of art that doesn't get discussed very much. The challenge is that learning systems aren't precise right if you have a sorting algorithm you pass the input in and you know what to expect when it comes back but learning systems are supposed to make mistakes sometimes so when you're looking at you know an individual decision that is made by personalizer and it seems like a crazy decision to you well maybe that's just one of the mistakes that it's expected to make every now and then so so how do we get through this? How do we like sort of get our heads around this and, and make progress reasoning when uh, we have a problem or not? Okay, there's something from uh, traditional software testing, which is called property-based testing, which is still relevant here. And it's used to try and debug really complicated software artifacts like big telco systems and so on. And the idea is you sort of write down something that is supposed to be true in a correct system. And then you run around and search for counterexamples to this. When you find a counterexample, it doesn't tell you exactly what your problem is. It just tells you that you have a defect. And then you have to kind of like dig in and figure out how to um, hunt it down and fix it. Okay. So what property can we exploit about learning algorithms? OK, so if you dig into these papers, you'll see some statement that's kind of like this. Like, OK, my learning algorithm is a box. You're going to give it some data, and it's going to give you back a policy. And it's not going to be that much worse than the best policy that you could have chosen. So like, you know, your, your policy has some free parameters like weights or something in a neural net. And uh, there's some, you know, setting of those weights, which is like best for your problem. And then I'm going to give you a setting such that the performance of what I give you is close. Okay. A lot of weasel words in here. So we kind of have to dig in. 
By the way, the uh, specification of this uh, guarantee in papers is actually quite precise. It's just not very legible. So it's not stated in this kind of like plain English, but I think it's more useful to discuss it in this way. All right, so let's talk about this word performance, try to flesh it out. What does it mean? And this gets to this question of evaluation. Um, you know, literally, how do you know if uh, you're doing better or not? And this is everything. If you've ever tried to win a Kaggle competition, for instance, um, basically, if you get the evaluation right, then you're going to win because you can try like a whole bunch of stuff and your evaluation will tell you whether an idea is a good one or a crazy one. And this is kind of where you're at when you're running an actual business and you're trying to use AI to improve that business. You're going to try stuff and then you're going to see what happens. So uh, one way to evaluate is to kind of like, you know, make a, a test bucket of some of your users and randomly assign them some treatment, like the treatment would be your new model. And then you just compare to like what you had before. And if it's better, then you say, okay, this is an improvement. This is in fact how you will ultimately decide probably to start using Personalizer at all. Like to start out, you'll probably have some other way of solving whatever problem you're trying to solve. And then you'll like set up Personalizer and run an A-B test, right? So that's fine. If you've done a lot of A-B testing or online evaluation, um, you'll quickly discover that the real bottleneck is that you run out of data. So you, you, know, you just start cutting up your, your users into these buckets and, and pretty soon you're out of statistical power. So you can only test so many things at a time. Now, there was a time in the 90s when people didn't even do this online evaluation. They just sort of thought things were a good idea, changed their software, changed their website, and then that was the new version. Um, especially on the internet where there was the ability to interact and have like quick, quick release cycles, people realized online evaluation was a better way to decide if an idea was good or not. And the companies that didn't do online evaluation basically disappeared. Now a similar revolution is happening, but with offline evaluation. So the idea here is, you know, online evaluation is a fixed resource. So you need to prioritize what you evaluate online and offline evaluation is a way to do that. You sort of like um, behind the scenes, take the data you already have and test to see if a new idea is better. Supporting this offline evaluation, this uh, counterfactual evaluation, is one of the main reasons for the existence of the product. Okay, so there are some things uh, in offline evaluation that are shared with supervised learning. Uh, so for instance, uh, when you're working with time series, uh, if you sort of do an online evaluation by drawing your train and test data from the same time period, then you usually get a biased evaluation. So if you've had some um, you know, experience working with time series, you know this is a no-no. All of those no-nos are still applicable to contextual bandits. So you have all the potential pitfalls of supervised learning, and I'm not gonna talk about them because this is a contextual bandit focused discussion. I will say this particular one, this particular mistake is impossible to make with Personalizer because Personalizer enforces this for you. But if you're using like DW uh, directly and you're feeding data to it, you might make this mistake. Okay, but then there are these problems that are contextual banded specific in addition to all of the problems that you might have had from supervised learning. So in contextual bandits, uh, the information that you've gathered historically depends upon what policy you had at the time. So if you decide to test a new policy, you have to deal with this distribution shift that occurs. And uh, that's the point of these counterfactual estimators. They attempt to deal with this distribution shift for you. 
And the other thing that's new, if you have experience with supervised learning, this will surprise you, is in supervised learning, your offline estimates of how good or bad some, a, a, a policy is, is more or less the same for every policy. But in contextual bandits, it's different. As you start to evaluate a policy that is increasingly different from historical data, the distribution shift becomes more extreme and the uncertainty in your estimate goes way up. This can really cause you trouble. So here you might have uh, some contextual bandit that you're evaluating offline. And there's a current system on the right here, this champion. Uh, and this is the thing you're trying to beat. And then you've done some magical data science modeling and you end up with this thing on the left and it looks way better. And you're like, yes, okay, ready to win. Send this one to online evaluation, right? Okay, these are just point estimates. Like it's a point estimate that the champion's at 2.5 and it's a point estimate that the challenger's at 4.25. If I put confidence intervals on these things, now you have a very different view. The champion confidence interval is very tight. You're very sure that the performance of the champion is somewhere between two and a quarter and two and three quarters. But this challenger, well, your CI is so big that it could be as good as four and a half and as bad as a quarter. And this is not atypical, right? I mean, this looks fake. If you have experience with supervised learning, this definitely looks fake, but this will actually happen to you. So that means uh, one of my practical tips is that you should be paying attention to confidence intervals when you're solving these problems. Uh, Right, I already talked about this effect, but essentially this is a, a typical effect because the policy that you're trying to evaluate is something that uh, is the result of a learning algorithm and the learning algorithm will naturally push the policy away from the historical data. Now you might say, well, if these confidence intervals are so important, why don't you just optimize the lower bound directly? And you can. Uh, with VW, you can use this flag to do that. Um, we are working on exposing this flag in Personalizer. Okay, so I did want to give you a little tip on how to make your own CIs. There are custom CIs available for contextual bandits, but um, this technique will let you compute CIs for potentially uh, arbitrary evaluation strategies. Um, so it's quite useful and it's quite simple to specify because here it is on one slide in Python. There are some technical limitations on this technique. You can't have like, um, there are certain evaluate functions uh, for which this technique will fail. You can read about those. Th those failure cases are actually kind of hard to come by uh, in practical applications. So as a first cut, this is a great way to get a confidence interval on anything. So if you have some kind of complicated evaluation strategy that involves like looking at the results of multiple decisions or something, basically what you do is you take your test set and you make a new test set from it by uh, resampling that one test set with replacement until like you have another test set of the same size. Then you just run your evaluate routine on that. You repeat that a bunch of times and then just find the quantiles of that process. And that gives you a CI. So that's very useful. Uh, there, this is described in more detail on Wikipedia. Okay, so we talked about performance. I discussed the importance of using a counterfactual estimator for contextual bandits. And also discuss the imp importance of paying attention to uh, confidence intervals. So now there's this other phrase in this property that's important, and this idea of uh, being able to represent. So you can only compete with policies that you can actually implement. And so sometimes this can cause poor performance in your system. So how do you know when you're suffering from this? Because 
if you knew what the performance of the best representable policy was, you wouldn't need a learning algorithm. Well, uh, the idea here is that you create baselines and you compare against those. So a baseline is a policy you know you can represent, but you also know is not very good. So this guarantee that you get from the learning algorithm that it's not much worse than the best policy implies that it should be able to beat the pants off this not very good policy. So one baseline that we monitor for you automatically in personalizer is this idea of like choosing an action uniformly at random. So you'd be surprised the first time you set up a personalizer loop and you're running all the data through it, you might find it challenging to beat this baseline because you might have bugs in your data pipeline or, or you know, some kind of corruption or other difficulties. So this is the first thing you wanna make sure is that you beat this thing. Also, um, the default hyperparameters in personalizer are quite good, but if you have a really strange problem, you may need to adjust them. And so if you're not beating this uniform and random baseline, uh, that's another thing to try once you've validated your data pipelines. Okay, I keep using this word representable. And so what I mean by that is if you want to beat something, you have to be able to mimic it. So you can think of like your policy has weights, for instance, and a learning algorithm is just some black box that's going to go through and set all these weights for you. So if you want to be able to compete with a baseline, you have to know there is some setting of the weights that lets you essentially be the baseline. If there's no setting of the weights that can reproduce the baseline behavior, you're going to have trouble beating it. Uh, so one way that this comes about is that uh, the thing you're trying to beat has access to more information than uh, than your learning system. This is especially true like if you're first starting out and you're like setting up Personalizer for the first time and there's some champion system you're trying to beat which maybe wasn't even put together with machine learning. Maybe it was just hand coded. And it can be difficult to identify all the pieces of information that it's leveraging. Anyway, uh, with respect to Personalizer specifically, uh, Personalizer provides another convenience, which is that it monitors the performance of a policy that always chooses the first action passed in. The idea is if you're trying to beat some champion policy, you, uh, you just sort of make its decision to be the first action being passed to the Personalizer, and then you can kind of track your performance against it. So this is where you'll see this kind of representation issue come about. You're beating the random uh, policy, but you're not beating this baseline. So how do you debug this? Well, you can debug the representation issue specifically by forcing representability. So if you want to be able to mimic anything, what you do is you take its output and put it in your input. So if you are told exactly what the action that the baseline would take is, then it's very easy for you to mimic it. You can just put a pop, if it's a binary feature of one or zero, which is like, this is the action that the baseline would choose, then you just ignore everything else and put a positive weight on this feature. And then you will always prefer the action that the baseline is choosing. So now you know you've mitigated representation as a possible issue. If you see a performance jump after you make this change that I talked about, that means there's something wrong with the information that you're feeding into the system. On the other hand, if the performance is the same after you make this change, then, then you have some other issue besides the information content of your input to the system. Maybe you're giving it the wrong rewards. Um, maybe the hyperparameters of the learning algorithm are set crazy. Um, but at least you know you've mitigated the representation issue, so the problem is somewhere else. 
All right, so now this last part, this part where they say not too much worse, right? Well, what does that mean? Well, it's actually a data dependent guarantee. So as you get more and more data, um, the gap between the policy you're learning and the best policy in your class should decrease. So this sort of naturally leads to this sort of question, like, well, how much data is required for success? So it's good to ask this question at the very beginning of a project before you even start, because just some basic back of the envelope calculations can let you know whether what you're trying to do is reasonable or not. So first there's these theoretical answers to the question and they come down to uh, the more actions, say, say like if you're passing a hundred actions to personalize her every time, then you're gonna need essentially uh, 10 times as much data as if you were only um, sending 10 actions to personalize her each time. So more actions, more data required, all things being equal. Now, if your reward is like got a lot of variance in it, then you're going to need more data. This is sort of this part is sort of similar to supervised learning, but you can imagine like, you know, if you're optimizing for purchases and purchases are very rare, then you're going to have to see a lot of sessions in order to get enough purchases for you to really understand what's driving purchase. And then uh, the other thing about contextual bandits specifically is that you know you're trying to explore and figure out what the best policy is and so to the extent that the differences in quality between policies are small you need to explore more to detect the difference between them so if most of your rewards are zero for you know like again with the purchase example or any kind of like sparse reward example uh, when most of the rewards are zero the performance of all policies is close to zero so it just takes a lot of data to try and figure out which one is the best one now uh, there are papers where you can go and look up like more precise formulas for this stuff i don't find the precise formulas to be extremely uh useful um except maybe to tell you when you're way off. Like if you only have like one decision you're making per day, uh, then you just don't have enough data to really do a learning approach at all. Okay, but there's this other question that people ask once their system is up and running, which is, oh, okay, maybe we don't have a bug. Maybe we just need to wait for more data to flow in, you know, run this experiment longer. You know, these are kind of like these uh, Hope Springs Eternal Hail, Hail Mary kind of thought patterns that prevent people from looking for bugs. So they're actually quite toxic. So um, I do have a heuristic that you can use to try and detect uh, when you do have a data problem. And uh, again, it, it comes down to confidence intervals. So if you're, uh, if you're like comparing to a champion, and uh, the champion confidence intervals are huge relative to its performance. And it, the same thing is true for the challenger. So this challenger would be, you know, the policy that you've come up with after learning on the historical data. Well, this is a sign that uh, you're, you don't have enough data or, you know, there's, there's something wrong with your data, okay? Like, um, maybe your reward is being randomized in a way you don't expect because of some bug or something. But given the data that's being sent in, you are so uncertain about how good or bad a policy is that you basically can't make any progress in learning. On the other hand, if you see this, here you're very confident that you are making no progress. So, adding data under these conditions will do nothing you'll just get more and more confident that you're getting nothing done you need to go well why am i unable to optimize this is uh is my reward misspecified do i have a representation issue you know start to go look at 
you know, what features am I passing personalizer? Am I giving it enough information to do well on the problem, right? But here, this definitely indicates you're not going to get anywhere with more data. You need to change something. All right, so this was kind of like a high level discussion to give you some ideas about how to debug a learning system. Uh, the most important thing is to get your evaluation correct. Fortunately, uh, if you're using Personalizer, uh, that is done for you in a very convenient way. VW also does that for you, but you have to, um, you know, you have to know how to use the software and you have to know how to interpret its outputs. Um, confidence intervals are way more useful in contextual bandits than they are in supervised learning because uh, the uncertainty about, about how well you're doing changes as you move away from the historical data. And these confidence intervals uh, can help you diagnose uh, some of your problems and, and, and maybe help you find where the defect is in your pipeline. And finally, uh, baselines are everything. Okay, like um, if you're beating uh, the easy baselines, like the random baseline and, and the pass the first policy in baseline, what you need to do is up your game and pick harder baselines. If you think about it, this is kind of how the science of reinforcement learning progresses anyway. But um, this is how you improve because uh, the, the fundamental property of learning algorithms is that they give you something close to the best policy. So if you can find some policy uh, that isn't best in your space, eventually you should beat it. Okay, so now uh, just as a like global recap before we get into like Q&A, you know, we heard a lot, a lot of stuff today, right? So Cheng kind of said, hey, you know, why does this product exist at all, right? Like, and there's been some questions in the Q&A that we've answered with text, um, uh, sort of talking about, you know, the importance of exploration and, and you know, don't think of this as just, uh, you know, canned data sets in a stationary environment. This is about like uh, reacting to all the real things that will happen in a real pipeline. So then uh, Rajan told us about some of the core learning algorithms that are, are behind this. Um, and then uh, Justin uh, showed us the product surface, which is like a much nicer way to access these, these core learning algorithms. <laughs> and then uh, apprentice mode, which is just of extreme practical utility uh, to, to a practitioner who's thinking about onboarding into Personalizer. Among other things, it lowers your business risk. You know, you sort of set Personalizer up. It's sort of learning from your existing system. You can see from its own estimates when it thinks it will do better. And so uh, then you can try an A-B test at that point with a high degree of confidence that you're going to have some success. And then uh, I discussed some things about how to debug learning systems in general and some of the specific gotchas that arise in contextual bandits. So at this point, I think we're ready uh, to do some Q&A. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, we have some questions in the Q&A. Uh, is this one already been covered? Uh, let me see. Yeah, you, you can just click the Q&A button. Right, right. So is there an LSTM flavor for RL? So look, um, there have been several questions like this in the Q&A, um, which focus on modeling technique. Um, in a sense, RL is agnostic to the modeling technique. RL is a framework for um, thinking about interacting with a world uh, where you only learn about how good or bad your actions are. So unless you do something, 
you have no way to know whether it's better or worse. Models are used in RL all over the place, right? But uh, you know, the model that's popular today, tomorrow may not be popular anymore. Whereas the framework of reinforcement learning has shown some uh, durability. It's uh, sort of been around now for almost a half a century. So that's how I would answer these questions like, is there an LSTM flavor for RL? I can certainly imagine that there are sequential decision problems where an LSTM might be a good choice for the model. But it's sort of more of an empirical question. And by the way, another thing like, when you are thinking about personalizer versus like reading like publications about like deep RL or something, um, personalizer is designed for real world scenarios where the primary constraint is the amount of data you have, especially relative to the non stationarity of the environment. So what you will discover in practice is, um, you know, supervised style models that are very flexible in these domains are not actually so useful because of the data constraint. Pre-trained models can be highly useful because they're basically leveraging a bunch of data from somewhere else. So you should definitely be looking at using other Azure cognitive services like the uh, image recognition APIs, like the text analysis APIs, to provide good quality inputs to Personalizer. But uh, Personalizer is about that last part, which is, okay, now we basically need to run online experiments using the RL framework to sort of learn from our own behavior. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, uh, for the folks, uh, um, if you want to ask questions, uh, please post uh, in the Q&A. Uh, we have a few minutes to do the Q&A. Um, and if you prefer to speak, uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, I will unmute you. You can speak to uh, ask questions too. Um, okay, I think we have another, uh, a couple of more questions in the Q&A. Oh, hey, Paul, they, I think they have uh, questions. I'm not sure if these are being answered, the last one. This, uh, you mean in the Q&A tab? In the Q&A. Uh, okay, so is there any kind of like nice uh, reference to the use of, con of confidence intervals and contextual bandits? Oh gosh, you know, unfortunately like there really isn't. This is more just like a dirty practitioner secrets. I mean, there are academic papers about how to compute confidence intervals and contextual bandits, but they won't talk about what you care about, which is how to interpret the confidence intervals to get a system working. So unfortunately, um, yeah, basically, just dirty practitioner secrets like what I just gave you. Okay, uh, is the first one, what about advice on building a bridge to NVIDIA's edge computing hardware? This one is being... Uh... Yeah, I think that one's hanging out there because it's a little bit... Um, so, so first of all, um, VW is highly embeddable. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've had like, like, People on the team have prototyped, for instance, <laughs> embedding VW into like uh, JavaScript so that you know you can sign up, kind of run it natively. Um, and VW uh, has been deployed 
in a first party context at Microsoft in a variety of embedded applications such as Skype. I don't know if the personalizer product surface provides a convenient way to work with an embedded system. I'm on the research side, so I don't know enough about the product. I can say you could definitely get it done with BW. Um, it, it could be that the product is limited to a REST API interface at the moment. No, um, we do have something that's exposed externally that is a plus, plus embeddable API. Oh, okay, uh, great. So then how would you, uh, how would you answer Lisa's question, Rajam? So yeah, we have this uh, uh, in the open, VW open source repo. There's a, a repo called Reinforcement, which uh, has the which is basically a C plus plus client that you could use uh, to publish data to uh, Personalizer. It is isn't like um, what most people do, so it probably requires more uh, a close uh, interaction with with us. You know, we uh, we would have to explain a number of things about how it works. It's really meant as a high performance API for C plus plus. Hey Rajan, uh, in the Q and A tab, yeah, can you just uh, type an answer to Lisa and, and put a link to the GitHub? I don't see it actually. I just uh, no, actually, it's, it's, it's in the chat. Basically, is the ones uh, you know if you can post the link. Uh, uh, in the chat, that would be great. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll post a link to the other repo. Awesome. Great. So, uh, do you guys have anything to conclude? Uh, we uh, have a couple of minutes to end the end of the event. Okay. Okay, one more question coming over. I think this is the last questions we're going to uh, discuss. Uh, in the Q&A, uh, can you say something about other cognitive projects in Azure? Well, it's a, it's a large topic, so I would uh, encourage <laughs> you to go uh, right. and look at Azure's like uh, cognitive services offerings. I just want to emphasize that uh, many, many of the outputs of those services are natural inputs to Personalizer. And the, the way you sort of put together a working system that's working well is you use the image understanding APIs or you use the text analytics APIs, to sort of featureize what's going on in your problem. And then you pass those sort of representations to personalizer to make the decision. Cool. Okay, I'm going to make a one uh, exception for the one more questions. Uh, since uh, uh, Sida, uh, go ahead, uh, you raise your hand. Yeah, hi, thank you. I hope you guys can hear me. Uh, thank you yes, for the great presentation. It was uh, wonderful, really. Uh, I had a question regarding the, the kind of bandit algorithms that are available. And also, um, I mean, from my understanding, there are various flavors like uh, UCB and Thomson sampling and stuff like that. Uh, is it possible to choose these algorithms? And also wondering how do contextual bandit algorithms compare to these uh, Q belief networks. Can you, if you could outline some of the differences, why some might be better than others in what cases? Thank right. you. Right. So, um, so many of these algorithms, like um, that, come from the Bayesian universe, um, like Thompson sampling. Uh, the way they're constructed is uh, they they may be working with such complicated distributions that they actually can't compute the values of the probabilities, and but they have a scheme for sampling from them. So they can generate samples from a distribution, but they can't tell you what that distribution was. 
So that makes it difficult to support counterfactual evaluation. So in the product, we have focused on banded algorithms that generate what's called propensities that we can then use after the fact to do this offline evaluation piece in a faithful way. Um, so the algorithms that we use are versatile. Uh, you know, we have like, you know, a, a soft max algorithm and we even have a, um, if you go and look at the VW code, you'll see all the ones that uh, we support. There's one that's kind of computing a randomized approximation to the Lin UCB bonus. Um, but, but it does so in a way that generates propensities that we can use for uh, counterfactual evaluation subsequently. Now, as far as Q learning goes, like the analog to Q learning in contextual bandits is learning a reward function. So uh, personalizer is learning a reward function for you by default. You would have to disable that. Um, and in VW, uh, if you use uh, the CB type IPS, then you won't get a reward function. But if you use DR or um, uh, DM or, or these other methods, then basically they're learning a, a reward function. 